All right, well, welcome everybody to The Pen Test is Dead, Long Live the Pen Test. Uh, I guess we we're going to get started despite the fact that we didn't get our, uh, our presenter view going, so we're going to be missing all of our notes. I will also forewarn you, we worked pretty hard to cut this uh, presentation down to 50 minutes from its original Black Hat 75-minute length. So we're going to push through our slides, and we expect that there will be some Q&A. Uh, we will ask that you hold Q&A until the end. Uh, at which point in time we will move it to the Q&A room so we don't uh, em, uh, encroach on anybody else's time. All right, with that, we will offer some brief introductions and then tell you guys a little bit about what we're talking about here. So I'm Carrick. Um, hello. Um, I, I probably know a bunch of you. Um, and probably a bunch more of you have seen me at the cons. I've been a goon for, uh, this is year five. Uh, I've been in information security since uh, 1997, really started doing a lot of uh, penetration testing, vulnerability assessments. Uh, I'm sorry, vulnerability testing. Uh, since 2000, um, I've done some instructing, um, minimal presenting. So if I'm not very good, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> so and, and these are just some of the cons that, that I have actually been on staff for. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Taylor. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Taylor Banks. Uh, Carrick and I have relatively similar backgrounds. We've both been in InfoSec since uh, about 97. Uh, I have also been performing and teaching penetration tests uh, since about 1999. Uh, I have done penetration testing for uh, large enterprise as well as state and local government, and I've done pen testing training uh, well for a wide variety of organizations, including large enterprise, small, medium enterprise, federal government, and military. Uh, so hopefully Carrick and I can both bring a, a little bit of different background, although we've been doing this for uh, equal lengths of time, and share with you guys some of our experiences in pen testing, some of the things we like, some of the things we hate, some of the things we love, uh, and at the same time, uh, talk to you guys about where we see this, uh, this service, this industry going. Wow, this is really not very smooth. Um, so, quick overview of our talk. This isn't a technical talk. We're not going to talk about zero day. We're not going to talk about um, black box reversing. This is, this is the classic network pen test is what we're actually talking about. So, uh, an overview of what we're talking about. With the pen test is dead, we're going to get a little bit into the history of hacking slash pen testing. Um, we're going to talk about pen testing going mainstream, seeing it in the movies. Uh, we're going to talk about tools driven a tool-driven methodology versus an actual uh, repeatable process uh, and how you go about selecting a vendor. We'll mention a little bit about that. And uh, our Long Live the Pen Test talks a little bit about how does it fit into the organization, what, when would it make sense to have a pen test done, um, and then the evolution of pen, pen testing as we've seen it over the past 10 years and uh, where we feel the future of pen testing is going. All right, cool. Clicker. So. As I've already said something about this, we're not presenting O'Day. It's not a technical talk. Um, hopefully it'll be fun. Hopefully it'll be informative. Um, so I'll just keep pressing through here. All right, on that note, I'm going to offer uh, a couple of warnings and a couple of disclaimers. The first disclaimer, uh, I'm going to potentially, uh, nay, no, I will most certainly offend many uh, of the people in this audience. Uh, I want to say this in advance. Uh, there are some smart folks out there doing pen testing, and rather than mentioning you by name, uh, you know who you are, right? If you've been doing pen testing for a long time, you know what a pen test is, and you've been providing good and valuable services to your clients, you will not be the people that I'm picking on. But uh, be forewarned, uh, I am going to lay some smack down on some folks. And uh, again, uh, I expect uh, to offend uh, some of those of you in the audience, so be prepared. Number two, uh, I was actually sent uh, an interesting uh, definition by Decode. Decode's another one of the goons here a couple of days back. Uh, it was an urban definition for social plagiarism. And it's kind of an interesting phenomenon that seems to happen more in this space than probably anywhere else I've seen. You're sitting in somebody's presentation or you're sitting in somebody's class and they begin to tell a story about a penetration test they've performed and you say, wait a second, that was my story. So I offer you this, right? We, uh, we're going to be uh, filling our presentation with some good stories and some experiences uh, that we've had doing penetration testing. If we hear you telling your our stories, we will find you. So there are our disclaimers. Thank you very much. OK, so part one, where we talk about pen test is dead. A uh, little bit of the timeline and history of penetration testing. 
Um, in the 70s, Captain Crunch, okay, multicolored boxes. Uh, 1980s, we have things like War Games. Anybody remember that movie? You've never seen that movie. Uh, Laud, Maud, um, Kevin Mitnick. Uh, in the 90s, DEF CON, all right? Woo! Yay, DEF CON. And then present day, uh, I Love You, a little while ago. Um, virtualization, big deal. Dan Kaminsky, one of the big names, rock star. Um, web 2.0, Web 3.0, Web whatever, uh, and Red Pill, Blue Pill. So, back in the day, uh, when pen testing started evolving as a service line, um, there were only a few people doing it, a few pretty smart people. They were typically this elite group of guys, uh, you know, long black coats. <laughs> um, very few organizations were doing it. It was kind of a novelty thing uh, around 99, 2000. Um, it was just starting to become a little more popular, and uh, information security was kind of poorly understood. Uh, typically when you do, uh, in particular, where you can really see the, the shift is an external penetration test. If you guys did uh, external penetration testing back in 98, 99, 2000, how often did you get in? Like, all the time, right? Today, doing an external pen test, a lot of times it's kind of boring because you find like five ports open, right? So it's not as fun. Uh, some of the initial papers uh, that started to kind of uh, embody or express the mindset of, of the culture of the people that come to cons like DEF CON and Black Hat, the Hacker Manifesto, okay? Uh, Dan Farmer and Vitsa Venema's paper uh, and their tool, subsequent tool, Satan. Um, just some more supporting information. Um, but it starts to, to show uh, an, an evolution of uh, hacking, penetration testing as a culture and becoming a viable service line. When you look at uh, Internet Security Scanner from, from ISS, uh, or Chris Klaus at the time, um, it was one of the first, after, after Satan, it was one of the first automated testing tools. Okay, so it started to open up this space uh, and uh, make it a more viable enterprise service line. So, quick story. Did a, an external and internal penetration test for a public school system in 2000, actually comparative test, so somebody else in the room might have actually uh, been with me on that test. Hope you're out there. Shouts. Uh, anyway, we were doing a public school system, and we found an SQL server exposed to the Internet that had two NICs in it. Um, one NIC was connected to the Internet. The other was connected to the, <laughs> to the internal network. It was on the internal domain and uh, had a blank password for the SA account. So, as you can imagine, there were probably um, plenty of external manipulations of the data in that database. You know, what grade do you want today? Uh, at the end of this engagement, uh, the report that was actually generated for this client took up two reams of paper. There were thousands and thousands and thousands of, of what Internet Scanner considered uh, critical vulnerabilities. So. This was kind of um, you know, an early on pen test exemplifies just how really bad it was. And what were some of the things that we found in those thousands and thousands of vulnerabilities? IIS Unicode, IIS the double D code stuff, uh, Solaris TTY prompt. I, have you guys all seen that? That's a, that's a great exploit. It's one of my favorites because it's so funny. Uh, fruit. This was something that manifested in AIX 13 years ago and then resurfaced its ugly head with Solaris 10, uh, where you'd basically tell that to the machine, tell it who you wanted to log in as, and uh, the, you'd, you'd put a dash fruit or dash F root in double quotes, and it just gave you a shell as that user. It was great. Uh, blank passwords. Saw a lot of blank passwords, a lot of default passwords. So these were, these were the kinds of things we were seeing in, in 99, 2000. So early on, really, those that were doing penetration testing were uh, essentially self-taught. And in fact, I, I would go so far as to say that probably the vast majority of those that were doing penetration testing were doing so because they didn't always wear white hats. Uh, I don't want to imply that they were necessarily all malicious hackers, but uh, most of us doing penetration testing got there because we spent time in underground communities and, uh, you know, hackers by night, pen testers by day. Around 2000, we started to see a kind of a change or a shift uh, in pen testing as a professional service. And we're going to work our way from, from history through present day. But uh, there was less agreement at the time on, on any commonly accepted methodology. Now, we can argue the, the, the need for a methodology, and in fact, later on, we most certainly will. 
But uh, up to this point in time, one of the things that we were facing is that we're no two pen tests were alike, and there are any number of reasons for this. Uh, we'll go into some of those as well. In late 2000, a gentleman by the name of Pete Herzog, uh, a.k.a. Idea Hamster, released a document that he dubbed the Open Source Security Testing and Method Methodology Manual, otherwise known as the OSTOM. Uh, the initial version of the OSTOM, right, OSTOM 1.0 and then later OSTOM 1.5, uh, these were a very good start, right? They were helpful in a number of ways, and it was certainly a laudable effort because there was really uh, nothing similar available to the professional information security community of this kind. Now, that said, the early versions of the OSTOM really served largely as guidance, and uh, while I was doing penetration tests, I wasn't going to go and replace all of my own handwritten methodologies with what I took verbatim out of the OSTOM, but I did find the OSTOM to be a, a great effort, and again, uh, it, it filled a gap. Uh, it filled a gap where, again, before there was no standardization, there was no methodology, and there was no way to guarantee that what Carrick and I might do on a penetration test were somewhat similar, if not completely different. So really what we had was a, a service in search of a methodology, right? We've got a, a number of organizations out offering penetration tests, and we're starting to move towards uh, finding a methodology. But the problem was, in 2001, there was too much competition, right? This was kind of a, a elite professional service. There's a number of organizations that are doing professional pen testing. But we see a lot of job process or job security through process obscurity. In other words, nobody wants to expose the methodologies they're using because then they feel they can't offer their clients some special secret sauce. Uh, the idea, you know, 2000, 2001, as long as you were good at what you did and you uh, provided thorough and complete results to your clients and were able to help them uh, correct the problems you found, hey, you won. But ultimately, this job security through process obscurity really only served to hurt us all. Uh, again, not only were no two pen tests alike, but in many cases, two pen tests conducted by two different individuals or two different organizations were so radically different that you couldn't really feel secure in the results of just one penetration test performed by just one organization. So my point here is that, hey, if it's not a repeatable process, ultimately it's not really a pen test. It's a hack. And there's, I don't want to say that there's not value to a hack, right? There's, there is some value in, in finding and breaking things with no process, no methodology. But lacking the process, lacking the methodology, again, we've got no repeatable process. We've got no way to ensure consistency across retests. So progress. Now, we move a little bit away from, from history here, and I've, I've thrown a, a handful of acronyms up on the board. Since 2001, we've seen a lot of changes in, in terms of available methodologies and available documents that provide frameworks for doing penetration testing. Uh, many of these documents have very different focuses. We've seen lots of changes in the OSTOM document itself. This was uh, Pete Herzog's document. This is now maintained by an organization known as ISACOM. We've got uh, some great web testing frameworks from OWASP. We've got guidelines and frameworks from the NSA. We've got NIST documents, Special Publication 800-42. So we've got lots of places where we can abstract information that ultimately help us create methodology, that help us create framework. And we've seen a lot of improvements in all of these along the way. So 2000, pen testing starting to get buy-in, as I said before. Uh, automated uh, testing tools are coming into the market. You start to see things like uh, Internet Security Scanner. Um, this was just before Foundstone Enterprise starts, uh, be, be came to the market. But you're seeing more and more tools out there, <laughs> figuratively and literally. Um, because what's happening is, as you have the automated tools, it's making it easier and easier for people to get into this space, come run a tool, give you a report. There's your pen test. Thank you. Have a nice day. There was nothing like a, a pen test framework uh, in 2000, 2001, 2000. Two, I can't remember the exact year that Metasploit came out. It was not long after, right around 2002 uh, or 2003. But uh, basically, you, you, you would cobble your kit together out of uh, exploits that you find on the Internet, things that you craft yourself, scripts and little bits and snippets of code. Um, one of the tools that, that we used at ISS was a tool that, uh, that Robert Graham wrote. He would take several different exploits out there that were, that were typically 
good quality and, and repeatable, he compiled them into one executable. And uh, then we would use that executable on pen tests and say, okay, I want to run, you know, the, this exploit, you know, some IIS exploit. And then you would pass it the parameters that you wanted and then it would send them. So it was kind of a convenient way to carry uh, a set of tools in one little binary, but it wasn't as nice as like a framework. Uh, I remember seeing a, a presentation by Elias Levy on uh, the concept of a framework at IO War Games uh, from SANS uh, back in 2001, right after 9-11. Uh, uh, which was, it was revolutionary at the time. So, what happens with, what we used to call them at, at ISS was scan now uh, assessments or, or penetration tests where basically uh, someone would come in, run a tool, uh, generate a 1,300 page report or you know 2,000 pages, whatever it was, ha hand that to the client, and now they're left to figure out what's important, okay? Uh, the problem with that approach is you leave the client with no guidance they, they, okay, well, we'll try and fix all the reds and then we'll fix the yellows. Uh, the problem is there's no strategic approach. There's no, uh, how, do, how do they determine within the context of their own risk what to do first? How much effort is it going to take? And the problem is what they're probably going to end up doing is running around and fixing all of these issues and then have to do the same thing next year because they didn't fix it from a process perspective. So. Uh, a lot of the pen tests that started coming into the market at the time were these scan now uh, assessments or pen tests, and it really kind of put a nasty smudge on, on our community. So we also start to see hacking in the movies, okay? Uh, everybody recognizes Matthew Broderick here uh, in War Games. Little sneakers, okay? Some favorite movies there. You guys remember this movie, right? Why did we watch this movie? Oh, wait. <laughs> uh, Matrix. Okay. Uh, anybody recognize that shot? All right. Yeah. What tool is that? Awesome. <laughs> All right. So, Swordfish. The only reason to watch Swordfish. <laughs> and here we go. We actually have a movie based on some real world events in the hacker community. Okay. So, how did you become a pen tester back in the day? So Taylor kind of kind of alluded to that already. Um, you, you went out and read a lot of text. Anybody ever read the Rainbow series? Okay, probably a copy of you here to help write it. Um, Smashing the stack for fun and profit. So there were several examples, several texts, things out there that you could read. Uh, you could get in an IRC channel, uh, hang out with some people, get a little mentoring. Um, but really, one of the crucial points to make is you need to understand the process of the attack, okay? Knowing a bunch of tools um, doesn't, really, uh, doesn't really make a pen test, okay? It's, it's really about a mindset. I'm going to stand back up. I can't see anybody on the left side of the room sitting down over here, and it feels like a much smaller audience. So uh, around the same time frame, right, early 2000, 2001, 2002, we also started to see uh, commercial penetration testing or applied hacking and countermeasures training. And in fact, both Carrick and myself were providing training of this ilk. Uh, in the early 2000s, right, in the 99, 2000, 2001 time frame, we had some good training available. So we're doing pen testing training or we're doing hacking training. But honestly, uh, it was good training. It wasn't great training. Uh, there were a lot of things wrong with, with what was being delivered uh, around 2000, 2001. Uh, I don't want to imply that it wasn't helpful and that we didn't, uh, we didn't smarten up a lot of people and help them understand and better identify their own vulnerabilities. But frankly, one of the things that we weren't doing was teaching a methodology. Uh, we were teaching a set of tools and we were teaching prescribed processes for how to apply these tools in an environment in order to find network vulnerabilities but we couldn't really truly teach a methodology primarily for two reasons. Number one, in order to really understand and follow the methodology, you gotta be able to think a bit like a hacker. The whole point of a penetration test, right, is to, to recreate this, uh, this environment. You know, we're, we're coming in from the perspective of a, a malicious attacker on our network. If you can't think like a hacker, you can't act like a hacker. So you can't teach someone to think like a hacker in five days. And furthermore, again, around this time frame, there wasn't yet a generally accepted methodology. 
Uh, although Isacom's uh, Austin was available, again, it was still it was a relatively early draft, and it wasn't replacing internal methodologies, so it most certainly wasn't something we were going to stand up uh, and deliver as the word in terms of how to conduct a pen test. All right. Uh, Got to see my slide now. So nowadays we see uh, a zillion and one uh, training organizations out offering offering hacking training, and uh, the training that we see nowadays goes by a million names, right? It's applied hacking, it's pen testing, it's ethical hacking. Uh, unfortunately, I'm going to uh, I'm going to tell you, in my humble opinion, I think much of the training we see uh, is truly really crap. Uh, it really is. We've got lots of, uh, of certified folks who are out there teaching tools and teaching process, but without understanding the tools and understanding the process themselves. Uh, to be completely honest, I've met, uh, I, I say in the slide a dozen, but I will say uh, a, at least a couple of handfuls of instructors who are out delivering penetration testing certification without ever having performed a penetration test themselves. Uh, really? <laughs> Seriously? All right. Around the same time frame, we also begin to see the emergence of hacking books. And I will say, we see hacking exposed release. This was really kind of the first of this, the, the, the genre of hacking books. And frankly, it was a really good book. It set the bar pretty high. Uh, again, largely tool driven, tool focused, but it was very well done. And, and the process uh, described within the hacking exposed book did begin to lay out the framework for performing penetration tests. In and of itself, the book wasn't going to turn you into a pen tester, but it gave you a lot of context in understanding how you began to go about the process of performing pen tests. Now, since that time, again, we've seen numerous other hacking books pop up. And while there are a few books that Carrick and I both believe to be the notable exceptions, most of the books that we've seen since this initial rush of hacking books are reworked, rewritten material, oftentimes with the same screenshots stolen from the other previously available books. So again, we're, we're seeing this uh, hacking go mainstream is, is really having its direct impact on the, the industry itself, right? We've got hacking in movies, we see hacking training, uh, penetration testing training being provided by pen test or by folks who've never done a pen test and, and books that are basically regurgitation of earlier books on the same topics. In fact, while Carrick and I sat at Borders writing the previous slide, we decided let's go see what's on the shelf uh, here at Borders in terms of security books. And sure enough, CISSP for dummies, hacking for dummies. Really? Really? Does that help us out a lot? All right. Now, again, I mentioned I'd probably piss several of you off, and I, I, I kind of hope that I do on this slide. But hacking certifications, uh, are you really serious? Right? Are you proud of that? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to give you my disclaimer here. I've got probably a dozen certifications myself, and most of them are probably about as worthless as the ones I'm picking on in this slide. But seriously, is a hacking certification any better than a note from your mom? I say no. Uh, I, 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 I'm telling you guys, seriously. Who, who in this room, who in this room believes that they know somebody qualified to certify a hacker? Because I damn sure don't, and there's a lot of smart people in this room. So a uh, hacking certification, give me a break. All right, so again, uh, you know, I knew I, I'd probably aggravate some of you. And in fact, some of you guys probably have the certifications that I am specifically picking on. Hell, I probably have some of them myself. That said, those of you who know what you're doing, hey, you're, you're one of the dying breed. You're smarter than your peers. And hey, we appreciate your efforts in, uh, in keeping the scene real. The rest of you and those of you whose faces turned bright red when I was picking on those of you with hacking certifications, you know who you are. All right, so the bottom line, though, and what Carrick and I are really trying to point out here is that it's not about the tools. And learning the tools, whether through a training class, a series of books, or uh, being certified on the tools that you learned in your series of books, does not a pen test make, right? A pen test is about a lot more than just the tools. You've got to understand the process. You have to understand the mindset and, in fact, possess the mindset in order to be able to go out and find the problems that are tr truly going to be those that will be taken advantage of, of by the attackers that you are trying to protect your clients from. So we'll just talk a little bit about some of those tools that have come out uh, over the years in MAP. Super, Super Scanner was one of my favorites. I used to tell people when I taught uh, Ultimate Hacking, Ultimate Hacking Expert, that if I had three tools I could take with me to my desert island, 
It'd probably be Metasploit, Kane and Abel, John the Ripper. Those are my favorites. Um, bone scanners and management tools that are out there. You know, Nessus is still a, still a great tool. Uh, I've used it on several engagements. Uh, and then, of course, there are a lot of other players in that space. Some of the wireless tools that have come out, AirCrack NG. I mean, that tool is pretty much the de facto bomb right now. You can crack a web key in less than two minutes. Um, and then, of course, some of the other tools that we use. Uh, I started using a lot of virtualization around 2003-ish, 4-ish. Until then, of course, I was multi-booting, which is so much more convenient. Um, but also the advent of uh, uh, bootable distros uh, were fantastic. I mean, Backtrack is, again, a fantastic toolkit. So shouts to those guys. Um, so here, here's actually an example of... Uh, Comparing, yes, tools have improved, but kind of takes a brain. Uh, I did a, an internal pen. It's actually there to review the, the voice over IP network. And uh, I kept trying to, you know, guess my way in. Uh, the way I kind of like to start on a pen test is slow and low, low impact. Uh, so I started digging around, looking at different systems, trying to guess my way into the few VoIP systems that were there. Um, and I came across the documentation for the voice over IP system on some, some share and started looking through and, oh, my God, <laughs> The password to everything was the company name with, like, ats for A's and, and threes for E's. Now, yes, a tool might have found that, but when you're brute forcing something uh, like a password over Telnet or whatever, um, it's less effective. Um, so it kind of illustrates the point that actually, just as an aside, I noticed when I was there that they were running a, a wireless network with no encryption. I thought, wow, that's a bold move. And uh, so I asked the guy, and he said, oh, we've got um, Mac filtering turned on, though, because you can't change that on the heart. This is a pen test literally like a year and a half ago. And an administrator told me that because you couldn't change the Mac address on a NIC, they were all good. <laughs> so how do you go about picking a pen test vendor? Well, it depends on what you're trying to achieve. Um, but... By that same virtue, I've actually spoken to some clients that have told me, well, I'll tell you what, if I really need uh, to pass a pen test, I don't want them to find anything, I'll pick these guys. If I really want to know it's got to be secure, I'll pick these other guys. Uh, so, again, just something to think about. Um, so, in summary, um, we're saying the pen test, as it was, uh, is, is dead. Uh, so... Summary of that section, we covered a little bit of the history. Uh, we looked at the lack of standardization. There was no real solid methodology or process for how to conduct a penetration test. All right? We also saw uh, a torrent of people coming into the space because, well, everybody can be a hacker. I can go buy two or three books, or I can take a class. I'm good to go. I'm a pen tester, right? I can get my cert. Um, but you can also skew those results by picking a vendor due to the lack of standardization. Anybody have this book? <laughs> All right, so we're going to shift into long live the pen test. Okay, what is it viable? Where does pen testing fit into the organization? Well, um, I've actually seen a presentation by somebody I didn't work with directly, but worked for the same company I worked for for a while. Uh, he was a software security guy. Um, it's actually John Viega. So he wrote Building Secure Software and was telling a room full of pen testers, so pen testing is stupid, the, the, the classic network pen, there's no reason to do that anymore. It's a dead-end service line. Imagine the looks on our faces <laughs> and the sick feeling. Uh, you looked around the room, I'm sure it was probably highly amusing to the fly on the wall. So, but the argument, is, is a pen test something that you could, you know, in, in terms of the classic network pen, is it really something that you can uh, commoditize every part of? Yes, certainly there are aspects of a penetration test that you could automate using certain tools. But I would argue, I mean, I've been on plenty of pen tests where you run uh, some automated scanner and it gave, you know, hey, pass. These guys are the bomb. You do a little manual digging and bam, you own the system. Um, I've also... Uh, I guess it's a mentality of if you have no software vulnerabilities, then, then you're solid. It, it kind of ignores the fundamental point that I, a lot of times I don't I've, – I've broken into many, many Windows networks without ever launching an exploit. Don't launch one if you don't need to. So it's not an issue of, of software security. It's more of a, a human issue. 
You know, okay, you can keep throwing technology at the problem. You can go buy a Mac. You can go buy IDS, IPS. And I'm not saying those are bad things. I'm not saying that they don't fit into the overall model. Um, but is it, is it really solving the problem? Um, so is pen testing dead? We really say no. Based on the results of the pen testing that, uh, that I've personally participated in, um, I would say it's a great way to, to pop quiz yourself. Are, are these uh, security initiatives, initiatives that I have in place, are these countermeasures that I'm deploying, are they effective? Well, and they may be effective within the context of everything you know today, but, you know, somebody like Lafayette, you know, comes in and owns your knack because he did something you didn't think of, how else would you validate that, okay? So um, one of the funniest quotes I've heard from, from, uh, from another pen tester, this is Marty Sells with ISS. Uh, we were doing a pen test, and he says, we're not conducting a penetration test. We're creating compelling events. <laughs> I found it highly amusing. Um, so again, as I said, it's like a, it's like a pop quiz. Um, you can, uh, let me just go to the next slide. <laughs> the, the point that I was trying to make was somewhere around here. We've lost our presentation view, by the way, so I've lost my notes. But um, essentially the point I was trying to make was that um, you can use the results of a pen test to, uh, to, to, ver to, to validate funding, to, uh, to get initiatives in place to secure uh, issues you already know you have. Um, so as another example of using uh, multiple issues or depending on, depending on a vulner vulnerability scanner uh, to identify all of your issues might not be that helpful. I actually did an internal pin for a client um, where one of the things they really wanted me to do was break into the AS400 environment. Um, I don't know that much about AS400, so I was looking at ways to get in, checking defaults, uh, ran an automated scanner, and it actually came up with a pretty good score. didn't find much stuff, but it did find Hmm, default SNMP on the AS400, or a default SNMP community string. So what can you do with that? Well, I looked at uh, all the things that, all the data returned from an SNMP walk and noticed, hmm, look, here are all the live connections. Well, what about the connections to port 23? Those might be interesting. So I also, uh, using a combination of, uh, you know, knowing that I could sniff on their network, they weren't using any anti-spoofing technology to protect themselves from network eavesdropping, combined which is semi-nasty, uh, combine that with now knowing where the connections are coming from to the AS400, I was able to capture an administrator uh, logging into the AS400 and had complete control of the AS400 environment. So it kind of exemplifies the point of, you know, you use something that isn't necessarily um, a bad thing. If you can find a couple of little things, you might be able to leverage that into something nasty. And that's the kind of correlation uh, that an automated tool it just isn't going to be able to do for you, I think, ever. It requires a, a brain. So interesting. What are the things we find now, right? After all the things we saw from the earlier section in history of the pen test, what are the things we find today? Well, believe it or not, it's the same stuff we found yesterday, right? We still have weak passwords. We still have poor architecture. We're still finding system defaults. We're also still finding vendor configurations and default vendor devices. In fact, in a large number of organizations that Carrick and I have both done pen tests for, we often find devices that the local administrators don't even have root on, nor do they have the ability to modify or patch because they are owned and controlled by the vendor. So in essence, despite all of these improvements, despite all of these things that would make us believe that, hey, if we write our code properly, if we secure our code effectively, we're not going to need to do network pen tests, that's hogwash. Unfortunately, the problems we see are not just software problems. So again, they're basically the same damn things that we, we saw 10 years ago. Have we learned anything? Well, yes, our software is getting more secure. We know that for a fact. We, we can test that, we can demonstrate it conclusively. But again, unfortunately, what we're talking about here goes well beyond just software problems. Software problems are the vulns, and we just got done spending 20 minutes telling you guys that a penetration test is not just a simple vuln scan. So if a pen test is not just a simple vuln scan, and we're telling you that, hey, most of the major problems we find are not necessarily or inherently s current software vulnerabilities, I tell you, unfortunately, there's still a lot of need for pen tests because it's the only way that we're going to identify these systemic issues. 
So, uh, you know, the other thing to understand here is that security is a process. It's not a project. And you've probably seen one of a dozen of these circle diagrams. In fact, I think any vendor that has ever done penetration testing had to create a circle diagram to describe the process or methodology that they used. But the idea here is that, you know, we're not just walking in, performing a test, walking out and moving on. Uh, number one, the environments that we're testing in themselves are dynamic. And a pen test is essentially a snapshot of a dynamic environment. The environment itself is changing all the time, and therefore we need to continue performing the processes and continue performing pen tests in order to ensure that changes in these environments and changes in risk profiles within these environments don't significantly affect the security of the organizations. Again, as I said before, if it's not a repeatable process, it's a hack, not a pen test. Now, there's something to be said for the fact that pen testing is, in essence, still somewhat of an art form, right? There is still some inherent uh, unique uh, focus or advantage that will always be imbued into a pen test by the person performing the penetration test. But there must be some semblance of a repeatable process. Otherwise, we've got no way to guarantee that when we go back and perform a rescan against our organization, that we are doing the same things in order to effectively determine whether or not the problems we found the first time around have been fixed, have been changed, have been improved. We started to talk here a little bit about metrics and, and, and about process and metrics. So if we look at the different approaches to pen testing, right, there's the, the yesterday approach, the 1999-2000 the uh, scan now pen test, right? We go in, we sit down with a client, you dump a 1,300-page report from scanner, I mean the custom report we generated for you, into a client's lap and then they run away. Uh, you sit and you talk with the clients and you say, hey, we're not really going to be able to accurately assess the risk of the vulnerabilities we find unless we can really define a risk profile and the client says risk profile what's that so you know again the pen test of, of yesteryear was something that was uh, it, it, it was driven by a lot more by vulnerable vulnerability scanning process whereas today we need to to move a bit beyond this and we're now moving from you know kind of a, a, a tactical approach to a strategic approach to pen testing so now, you know, our, our goal here or our aim is to be able to sit with our clients and have remediation plans and action plan matrices that actually deal with highest impact, lowest cost vulnerabilities first, right? We need to help them fix the problems that are going to most directly influence or affect them immediately before we go on to fixing things like SNMP default community strings on an isolated out-of-band air gap network. All right, so again, we talked about metrics, and, and honestly, we could probably have a, a, a whole other presentation, or for that matter, a series of presentations on uh, metrics and process and frameworks, uh, and in fact, we, we'd probably love to do just that. Um, it's impossible to capture what would be in the optimal metric when doing pen testing or the, optional, the optimal process, but we know that there are things that we need to focus on and need to identify. Uh, there's a couple of interesting components here. We, you know, one of the things Carrick and I had a, a discussion, and we talked about changes in the vulnerability landscape during the time uh, when a penetration test is being performed and across systematic rescans. And therefore, as we're looking at the results of these tests, we realize, hey, you know, 13 new vulnerabilities were released for the systems that we tested since the last time we did a pen test for this organization. That needs to find its way into the metric that we use to produce the results for our clients. But we also need to focus on things like, again, for instance, uh, business process. Uh, you know, we need to understand that, hey, uh, the, the risk associated with an individual vulnerability ties back to what an organization does and what information is affected by the vulnerability that we found. Again, as I said before, uh, you know, two pen tests are always still going to be influenced by the pen testers. And honestly, that's a good thing, right? Otherwise, hey, we'd all be drones. Uh, so despite the fact that this is not a tool-driven uh, driven process, and although I, I encourage and suggest and, and talk to the points of methodologies and process, again, uh, we know that, you know, tests are influenced by the individual pen tester. And again, uh, that's, that's an important part of this process. We said vuln counting is ineffective, you know, and, and one of the things is 
let's say we've got findings uh, in a new scan, right? We've done a scan for an organization. We go back. We do a, a systematic rescan. We come back, and now we've got new findings. So what does that tell us, right? Has the organization changed? Has there, have they made changes within the environment? Did the tester change? Did the tools improve? Or what combination thereof, right? Did the tool improve and the tester improve? We brought new people onto the team. Oh, and by the way, they, they turned on seven new systems since the last time we performed the scan. Well, unfortunately, the only way that we can really begin to address this issue is with metrics. So an example of this. Uh, I actually had a client, we went out there in 2006 and uh, did an internal pen for them where we were able to own total like 60 systems. I felt like it was a complete failure because you have to own them all. Um, so the, the, the reason for this, actually I'll get into the reason when I kind of summarize the whole thing. 2007, we show up, um, owned everything by like 11 and 15 on Monday. So we're, we're explaining the results of, you know, the client comes to me and says, w you only got limited control the first time. We haven't really made any significant changes uh, to the environment. W what the hell happened? So I start to explain, well, the first time what happened was we came in, we'd find a vulnerability on a system, take advantage of it, get into the box, uh, rape the accounts off of it, and we'd have to shut those off to a, a machine somewhere else because you, you couldn't run password cracking on your local machine because it pretty much makes it a brick. Um, so we'd push that off, run John the Ripper somewhere else, uh, and it would be recovering the password. Maybe it would take a day to get a password back. You'd get about 11 or 12 more systems and bam, hit a new brick wall where that password wasn't good anymore. Uh, it was kind of a byproduct of the company growing through acquisition and uh, different groups had owned different pieces of this thing and they hadn't really solidified it all together yet. So it was, it was highly segmented in terms of what chunks we were able to get our hands into. Came back the next year. Um, what had happened was, you know, I had some rainbow tables with me. I had uh, John the Ripper had been upgraded to, to version 1.7, and it was taking me about 15 to 20 minutes to compromise passwords. So, and I don't know, maybe I got better. I don't know. Might have learned something new, a new trick, or whatever it was, but it, it kind of illustrates the point that there was no dramatic uh, change that the enterprise, they hadn't necessarily gotten less secure. It was more an evolution of the tools and maybe an evolution of methodology or, or some approach or technique that I used that dramatically impacted the ultimate results of the test. Okay, So when we talk about a metric systems, how do we capture all this? How do we determine if we're getting better? All right, so we come back to frameworks, and I threw a bunch of, uh, of acronyms and, and pictures and icons on the board before, and so now I'll come back and readdress a few of these. Uh, you know, again, we've seen some significant improvements in the frameworks and the methodologies that we have used and or contributed to across the past 10 years. Uh, the OSTEM itself has improved. We've also seen release of a, uh, a new framework called the ISSAF. Uh, we've got a couple of frameworks provided. Kevin Ori has a pen testing framework publicly available, as I mentioned. NIST special publication 800-42 talks about guidelines for network security testing. Uh, we've even got a, a wireless penetration testing framework that got rolled up into uh, Kevin Ori's overall pen testing framework. Again, these are all great starting points, and they're all a, a, a great set of guidelines or a basis upon which uh, we can influence the, the tests that we are performing. However, uh, you know, we, we've had this problem with not being able to see the forest for the trees. And so now, again, one of the things that we need to understand is that because we're no longer just focusing on individual vulnerabilities, uh, we've got to look for the systemic issues, the architectural issues within our environments. Uh, unfortunately, even methodologies might not help us there, right? When we're looking for architectural problems, uh, the specific subset of UDP ports to scan in order to be compliant with somebody's methodology document is not really going to be very useful. Again, we talk about move from tactical versus strategic, whereas tactical was our process of just basically identifying, categorizing all known vulnerabilities, whereas we move into strategic, which is a, a more systematic approach, right? We're trying to find not only system level vulnerabilities, we're also trying to find these architectural issues. And we're trying to correlate all of this back to, again, the organization for whom we're doing the tests, 
uh, business, to their, their risk, right, to the, the risk profile associated with the nature of the business they're doing and the information affected by the vulnerabilities that we find. So, uh, again, uh, this is something that, that is really only going to, to uh, be improved through the development of appropriate metrics, right? We, we need systems that we can use to help us identify and to help us provide information that ties back to the vulnerabilities to the, organ or to the systems that we find and include things like uh, risk associated with uh, a business profile. We mentioned complexity and, and likelihood of attack, and this is rather important because, again, the likelihood of an, an attack as well as the complexity of an attack will affect the likelihood of that attack affecting the systems within the organization. All right? So we move into pen testing in the 20th, 21st century and beyond. Fortunately, we've got five minutes and we've only got 45 more slides. All right. We talk about methodologies. One of the things that's important here is an organic methodology. In other words, a methodology that is going to improve as the, uh, the state of penetration testing improves. And, and one of the, the real benefits to the documents that we mentioned or that we referenced in some of these slides is that most of these are open source documents or open source methodologies. While they have groups of core contributors, the bottom line is that they are open for contributions from any and all of us. And this is an important part of this process. Right? Where there are flaws, omissions, or where these frameworks and guidelines are lacking, it's up to us to go out and flesh them out and identify what they are missing and where they are lacking in order to ensure that in the future these documents and these guidelines can help improve the consistency of tasks performed for our clients. We talk about adapting to new technologies, and this is something that I think frightens a lot of folks doing penetration tests, right? Is what happens as we see changes in technology, we see things like, you know, Ajax, Web 2.0, we've got new technologies like NAC, and, and oftentimes these technologies are deployed within organizations before the folks that are hired to do penetration tests really have an opportunity to identify how the systems work and how they might be compromised. So we got to ask ourselves, what can we do or how can we go about adapting to these new technologies, especially when, frankly, they're technologies we might not fully understand. So we say, well, there are two ways. Number one, the easy way, be Billy Hoffman. Or number two, uh, we do essentially what, what software developers have been doing in building secure code. We do threat modeling, we do attack modeling, and we fuzz, right? We, we treat these uh, environments in the same way we would treat a piece of software that we are trying to secure from the ground up. On the topic of threat or attack modeling, uh, you know, this is again uh, something you will read generally in the context of software development. However, at an abstract level, the process of threat modeling applies equally well to an unknown or unidentified technology when conducting a pen test. Right? We're trying to identify essentially data flows. We're trying to look at, at where is a piece of data, who owns or modifies that piece of data, where does that data go, and what trace trust relationships or boundaries exist between the pieces of data that affect this system. So can you test without a baseline? Yes. Unfortunately, the problem is testing new technologies and testing without a baseline is going to produce, produce results that will be more difficult to quantify uh, and more difficult to define or associate qualitative values with. Right? We start testing new technologies. The problem is, even though threat modeling can help us identify where the weaknesses are and help us identify vulnerabilities within the architecture or configuration of these systems, until there are baselines for these new technologies, relating that information back to the risk profiles and the organizations we're doing testing for is certainly not going to be an easy task. <clears throat> Lastly, we, we ask ourselves the question, how can we really provide quality assurance in the context of a pen test? And by that, here's what I mean. How do I know if one pen test is good and one pen test is bad? If we don't yet have effective metrics, and we're saying that the number of vulnerabilities is not necessarily an indication of the security of the environment, especially if we're ignoring risk profile of the organization, how can I look at two different penetration tests and say, well, this organization or this individual did a good job, and this organization or this individual did not? Well, again, uh, we're going to have to come back to process. 
Uh, the only way that we're going to be able to come back and define quality assurance or quality control in the scope of penetration testing is through effective metrics. And these, these metrics are things that, again, through working with and adapting the existing frameworks, we're going to be able to define and improve, and it will be an ongoing and uh, ever-changing process. Okay. How do we justify a pen test? How do we position this? All right. I got one minute, so I'm going to go really fast. Might be a legislative requirement. Might be a general, a genuine interest in the environment. I've alluded to this a little bit um, earlier, and clients really kind of fall into those two categories. Um, I actually did, and this will probably be our last pen test story. Did an external pen for a company. Um, was able to compromise multiple Oracle servers. Uh, found PII. Found credit card receipts. Found. Uh, my favorite one was this picture that I found. So um, I actually found a, a file share and started digging through it and found this series of pictures. And there was this woman that was having something removed from her leg that was this large growth tumor thing. Um, so you watch the process, and they have you know one snapshot removing it. And then in the last snapshot, the doctor is standing there <laughs> with the tumor under his arm. Now you have to ask yourself... What's the exposure there, okay, a, a legal exposure? Um, and the, probably their biggest problem from an architectural perspective, they had no external firewalls. So anybody could have viewed that particular sequence of, of photographs. All right, so we, we, we make it to our conclusion slide just as we, uh, we hit the, the final moments of our talk. Again, you know, Carrick and I wanted to focus on a couple of points here. And, and, you know, the first half of this presentation was dedicated to what we called the pen test is dead. What we're saying here is that yesterday's pen test is dead, right? Simple vuln counting is no longer effective. While what worked then still works now, we've had to evolve and adapt to the process to meet the requirements of changes in technology and changes in security within and around the organizations that we have been working with. The second portion of this talk, we focused on essentially long live the pen test. And what Carrick and I both posit is that despite the fact that improvements to the quality and security of the software we are developing, despite the fact that this will inevitably help our organizations and improve security on the whole, it is not going to mitigate the need for network-based penetration testing. In many cases, network-based penetration testing remains the one effective way that we've got to identify problems within organizations that go above and beyond simple software vulnerabilities. Everything we said may be a lie. Thank you guys very much for coming. I also want to thank DC404, right? We're, we're part of the Atlanta DEF CON group, and we ended up with seven presentations at this year's DEF CON. So thank you, uh, thank you, DC404, and thanks to all of the other speakers from DC404. You guys all did a great job.